Hi there, Rachel here. Welcome to another episode of the Ditch the Diet podcast. host Rachel Watson. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Ditch the Diet podcast. This is a podcast for people all over the world who want to learn how to quit your dieting and start living a healthy lifestyle without restriction. We want to help you to say goodbye to food guilt and start improving your relationship with food. And in order to do that, this podcast is sponsored by the Ditch the Diet Academy, which is the membership site that is your alternative to a lifetime of slimming clubs, where we will teach you the exact steps to take to quit dieting forever and improve your relationship with food, get your confidence back, and also along the way, learn about how to improve your overall health. You can check that out at ditchthedietacademy.com. I'll tell you a bit more about that at the end. In today's episode, I am going to be talking about the topic of female hormone health, in particular about the menopause with Dr. Hannah Short, who is a GP and is passionate about this topic. And she is also a menopause specialist. It's something that I've wanted to talk to someone about quite for quite a while on the podcast because I get a lot of questions from people about how to approach the menopause, um, including how to manage symptoms and improve quality of life whilst going through this difficult time. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this episode. At the end, uh, Hannah will tell you how to get in touch with her if you want to know more and also how to get in touch with a menopause specialist if you feel that you would like to get some more uh, information and more help with your own symptoms. I really hope you enjoy this interview. If you do, please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. There are lots and lots of episodes. I think we now have over 60 episodes that you can listen to. And um, also share it with someone that might uh, feel the benefit of it as well. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Um, Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Hannah Short. Thank you very much for joining me today. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about who are you and what you do? Oh, well, thanks for inviting me to be on the podcast. Um, so my, yeah, my name's Hannah and I'm a GP and a menopause specialist and I work in Newmarket in Suffolk and I have a private menopause clinic there. Um, so that's I've set up in the recent year, um, largely because there's no provision on the NHS really in our area. Mm-hmm. And um, what sort of when did you take a sort of special interest in menopause or premenstrual disorders? Was there a part of your training that you did that you enjoyed or, you know, how did you get into that sort of side of things? Uh, it's quite a kind of long story and then there's a personal story behind it as well. So I, I've had hormonal problems, I think, ever since my period started. Um, and that includes endometriosis. So I had very painful periods throughout my teenage years, 20s and early 30s. Um, and I also always suffered with a bit of PMS, which seemed to get a lot worse as I was getting older. Um, I actually went to med school when I was 27. So it was a kind of career change for me. Wow. Um, and I, but I think so by that, by that point, by the time I'd kind of completed my medical training and got into general practice training, um, because I'd had my own issues, I was well aware of all the hormonal health problems that can affect women. And I noticed that there are a number of women, especially in their early to mid 40s, are coming in with a wide number of different symptoms that didn't really seem to fit any particular pattern to me. So there were the typical symptoms you hear about when with hormonal changes um, to do with menopause, like hot flushes. But a lot of women were coming in with things like anxiety, joint pain, fatigue, um, all of those things, which and I know there are many things that can kind of cause those symptoms. But there was definitely this particular group of women around the mid 40s. And it's like, I'm sure there's something else going on. Um, and it was pretty clear that it was perimenopause. So the lead up to, to the menopause and women's final period. And. Um, at some point, I remember talking um, to a, one of the GP partners. So this is when I was just very early on in my training and saying, is there anywhere we can kind of refer these women who we can't deal with in general practice? And at that point, he said, no, um, there's no one in this area doing anything like that and refer down to London. But again, it was only private clinics that were doing that. So I started having more of a professional interest from that side of things. Um, and then when I was 35, I unfortunately ended up needing a hysterectomy and my ovaries removing um, because of my endometriosis and and also because I had very severe form of PMS known as premenstrual dysphoric disorder 
Whereas I'd I'd feel horrendous in the last in the two weeks leading up to the period, you know, feeling like it wasn't worth going on at some points. And but then as soon as my period came, apart from the pain, my mood was better. Um, and the only way really to treat that, because um, I tried all the other medical options, was having the hysterectomy and my ovaries removed. So then I was thrown headlong into surgical menopause um, and realised even as a doctor um, and somebody who had access to all the information, I was still struggling to get the information support I needed. So cut along. Well, no, I've not, not really cut it short, I'm afraid. <laughs> but, um, I then ended I up... I like the long versions. <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I ended up going to kind of some conferences the British Menopause Society getting involved with them have run a social media campaign met with other doctors working in the field and and things like that and then I've done further training and so I'm now a qualified menopause specialist on top of being a, a GP um and so that's kind of how I how I got to this position really so it's, so it's five years down the line but yeah wow I think um when you have when you take a special interest in such a such a sort of niche area so there's often like everyone I speak to there's often a personal reason behind it mm. so it's it's always nice to hear people's stories even you know now that you're helping other people with similar um like with a similar situation to yourself and um I come up against this all the time in our membership we have a lot of people that have um perimenopausal symptoms or are going through the menopause and I feel often I feel quite helpless uh, in a way to help them because mm. I don't have the personal experience yet thankfully no of course um, yeah but um you know people come to me with all different symptoms and they they believe that these symptoms are not normal or they've never heard someone else have these symptoms and could this be men could this be menopausal symptoms or not and they find it really hard to get the sort of help that they need um so what what exactly just for those uh, those of us who are um, I suppose, don't know if lucky is the word, lucky enough to not have mm. gone through it yet. Um, what exactly is the menopause and what can we expect when when it does happen? Well, the me- the menopause really refers to a woman's last period. And then you, you're said to have you know reached the menopause one year after your final period. But I think the terms can get quite confusing. So there's also the term perimenopause, um, and that's in the lead up to your final period. But that's probably when your hormones are starting to change and um, you know, levels of estrogen and progesterone are going up and down and periods may start becoming irregular. But equally at that time, um, sometimes it's the mood changes and stuff that can happen first before things like uh, you, you know your periods start changing. Then when you've gone a year without a period, you're then said to be postmenopausal. So the average age for menopause in the UK is about 51 years of age. Um, but any time really from 45 onwards would be kind of, you know, a typical or kind of an, an you know, normal age really to go through that kind of change. But but you can feel symptoms before your final period. So it's sometimes as many as up to 10 years before. So even some women in their late 30s may be experiencing some, you know, minor perimenopausal symptoms, but they wouldn't necessarily know until they look back and um, over the years. Um, symptoms can vary. So everyone's kind of heard of the hot flushes, um, but 80% of women will suffer with hot flushes. Um, so that so, I mean, does mean 20% don't. And... <clears throat> And so, you know, I think that's what sometimes can be quite confusing. If you're not having hot flushes and you're having lots of other random things happening to you, wondering if that is the perimenopause or menopause, um, things like that. So when I was doing uh, my early training, the the thing I think that struck me was more the psychological symptoms that seemed to affect women the most and they were least prepared for. So things like the anxiety, um, feeling overwhelmed, and that's a really big one because I think so many women, I mean, pretty just about everybody really is juggling so many things in their life, whether they're a parent or not, whether they work full time or not, that, you know, everyone's got so many jobs and roles and, and responsibilities and probably in your mid 40s or whatever, it's probably when stuff's almost at its peak because often people have children and they may be looking after elderly relatives um and also trying to manage it you know house and and work and everything else and i think some women just feel that they get to this point and maybe it's all caved in on top of them because they feel like they're not coping but i think the truth of it is a lot is the hormone disruption really that is that is you know the, the trigger for the worsening anxiety at that time 
So um, that's the predominant thing. And then obviously with anxiety, you can get low mood and panic and um, and all of those symptoms as well. Memory issues. A lot of women worry that they're getting early dementia. But we know it's the fluctuating levels of estrogen that are causing um, that, that problem with finding words. So it's particularly finding nouns that women struggle with. And we know that it's because estrogen affects that particular part of the brain. And that does tend to get better. And it's not a sign of dementia. So that's often reassuring to hear. Yeah. Um, symptoms like joint pain often get worse and um, or, or just come about. They you know, may not have had that before. And yet I see women who are told, oh, you're just getting older. But it's like, well, we're all getting older. But at 40, mid 40s, you're not old. And you should be active and it, it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle so there's um because all of these things then means that women are less likely to be able to do the things they need to help themselves um i mean the list kind of goes on there's there's the whole list of vaginal symptoms as well like vaginal dryness and pain with sex um things like that that a lot of women don't talk about but many women do suffer um lower sex drive that can have an impact on women's self-esteem and on their relationships yeah um, yeah, so I think there's there's so many symptoms that um and and it can be quite confusing. I think it's good to look at them in a big picture and think actually yeah this there could be something going on here um and not try and look at them all individually. And it's because there's estrogen receptors all over the body. Mm-hmm. And I think like you say, it can be. I think it's still something that a lot of women don't talk about, especially to each other. <laughs> um, so they they kind of they they sort of hold back talking about it and make it worse and some of these symptoms sound like they could be quite frightening especially things like you know anxiety panic attacks and memory loss sound like something that you wouldn't want to sort of be dealing with on your own no exactly and i think that's why it's really important that people are talking about it so i think Things like, you know, celebrities, quite a few celebrities in recent years have been speaking about their experience. And I think that's great because it does open up that conversation. Yeah, um, I think before, it's, you know, women have been the butt of jokes about hot flushes and things like that. But actually, it's the other stuff that, I mean, really do affect women. And some women do have terrible experiences with hot flushes and maybe they're changing their bedclothes throughout the night because they're drenched in sweat. and. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some women, the symptoms don't go away. I think that's one thing that women don't realise that the average length of symptom duration is seven years. Um, but up ten percent of women can have symptoms for up for upward of fifteen years, and some women they never really go. I mean, they tend to get better, so I don't want to kind of panic anybody. Um, but there are some women in their eighties and nineties who still have hot flushes. Um, so, oh, I don't want to get older. <laughs> no, 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 not, 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 not every woman will experience yeah, um, yeah. symptoms. So it is important, and, and a lot of women will have mild symptoms that they can maybe manage with lifestyle changes and dietary changes. So yeah. it isn't it isn't all doom and gloom. Um, it's just I think for those women who really suffer, it's important to know that they're not alone and there is help out there. And mm-hmm. I think maybe an understanding of what is happening is helpful. So mm-hmm. it's because obviously our eggs no um, our ovaries are no longer able to produce eggs and as a, that's why the hormone levels fall and it's the taking away it's the fluctuations of the hormones in the perimenopause that cause the issues and mm-hmm. then after that it's the low levels of the hormones mm-hmm. and what would be the traditional treatment for women that are going through the menopause do they have different options sort of from a medical point of view well the, the most effective treatment for for menopausal symptoms is hormone replacement therapy um or hrt um and uh, and I'm 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 a big kind of proponent of HRT when it when it's when it's needed. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of scaremongering about it in recent years, and that's because of some trials that were published in the early 2000s, which said that um, HRT was really risky and increased your risk of heart disease and um, you know dementia and breast cancer and things like that. And so women kind of came off it overnight, and and doctors stopped prescribing it. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, these trials were very um well they were misinterpreted when they were published and the women who'd been studied in the trials were often 20 years older than women who we would give hrt to would be so mm. um there were a lot there were lots of problems with that but unfortunately even though the study's been re-looked at and reanalyzed and said actually these these risks aren't as great as they seem and actually some of these risks just do not apply at all a lot of women still remain scared and it's a real shame because for most women under the age of 60 and within 10 years of menopause, the hormone replacement step therapy is, is the most effective thing for menopausal symptoms and it also helps with bone health, heart health and brain health. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, 
and it's you know it's really important not to listen to the the hype sometimes isn't it you know the the media sort of grab hold of something and then before we know it um, everyone gets a bit scared of doing something that could ultimately help in a big Definitely. way. Um, so I mean, no, that's 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 probably the. I mean, that that would be the kind of the main option, really, in terms of me- medical treatment. And so, for most women, the the benefits of um far outweigh any risks. Um, and so it's estrogen and progesterone that you can take. And there's tablets, there's creams, there's patches, there's different forms of HRT out there. Um, and the the ones that you give th- through your skin, so the transdermal um, estrogen, um, they don't have any risk of, of blood clots or anything like that. So that's one of the concerns with the tablet form of HRT. It can very slightly increase your risk of blood clot, much like the contraceptive pill can. Um, but again, in a woman who's got um, a low risk for blood clots, um, say somebody who's slim and active and, and no family history of blood clots and doesn't have a history of migraine, they can take tablets and the risk will be very small. Um, but it's important to so say women who are overweight or have a migraine or family history of blood clots can take the um, the HRT through the skin, so patches and gels, and there will be no inc- added increased risk there as well. So. Um, and what about a sort of nutritional intervention? I know that you're you have an interest in plant based nutrition. So, mm-hmm. um, have you used nutritional therapy or nutritional interventions to help uh, women with menopausal symptoms? Yeah, well, I, I always talk about um, nutrition and lifestyle with patients because I think it always forms part of the picture. And I think just to live well and to have a healthy life, it's you know that it's important to address that. And that I feel there's little point in me giving HRT to a woman um, and then not advising her about how to eat well and live well because it, it's not you know HRT can help, but it's not the only thing that will help, and and it's not really going to help you that much if you're continuing to drink alcohol every night or. Um, you know, eating a lot of fast food and things like that. So, uh, yeah, I do talk about it also because there's there's studies out there saying that the more um, of a plant-based diet you have, the, like, the more likely you are to have fewer menopausal symptoms. And we think that is because um, the there's all the antioxidants and stuff in the plant food so make it a lower inflammation diet so it's an anti-inflammatory diet so there was a study really showing that in perimenopause the body's um, got slightly low level of inflammation going on um and so estrogen is anti-inflammatory which is partly why that that helps when we add when we add that back with hrt um but also um incre- increasing more plant foods in the diet can also help with that and um, so minimizing um, junk food and animal products um, and processed foods can be really beneficial. And some women find that that can make a huge difference um, to their symptoms. Um, and I, th- I think I mean, I mean, that last phrase, that's the main thing I, I kind of advise on is just include more plants. And especially things like beans and legumes are really good because not only did they kind of help with kind of hormonal balance but they also help reduce the risk of things like heart disease which increases after we age and, and as we enter menopause um also including things like soya and and chickpeas because of the plant-based estrogens in them so they're not estrogens but they act on the same receptors and they can have the beneficial um side, side of things there and especially in women who can't take hormones for example they, they can be helpful yeah i was going to ask you about soya actually um because i remember years and years ago um because i eat quite a lot well i would say i eat quite a lot of soy products and someone said to me probably six or seven years ago now that um to stop eating so much soy because i was going to gain weight and increase my risk of getting breast cancer and all sorts of things and then scared me off of it for years and then and then you read then you read the the complete opposite to that so a lot of, a lot of women do do speak to me about that and they they say oh i read this and it told me that if i was to eat more soy products i was going to increase my risk of getting cancer and then someone else told me that i should eat it because it's going to help me with the menopause symptoms and it can be so confusing i think sometimes <laughs> no it can be and um i think it's like there are almost as many myths about um soya as there are about hrt um and is i think there's all this scare around the word estrogen which is a real shame because estrogen generally for mo- most of us is, is actually very beneficial and helpful hormone and um so in terms of soya the, the from the evidence and, and all the research i've looked at there there is no reason really to avoid it unless you have an allergy um and you don't even with thyroid disorder you have to be a little bit careful because there are some stud, animal studies which suggest if you have high 
high doses of soya supplements, so we're not talking about food, but supplements, that can have a negative impact on, on thyroid if you have a thyroid problem. But in people who've got a, a you know no problem with their thyroid gland, um, not any thyroid medication, then there's no concerns at all about soya. Um, and it, it's very heart healthy um, and it, it's, it can help with menopausal symptoms. I mean, you'd have to probably have to eat quite a lot for it to have an impact on the menopausal symptoms. And it may be that you wish to take a soya supplement if that was the route you know somebody wants to go down but it certainly can help kind of minimizing um, menopausal symptoms it's it also has what we now think is a protective effect on the breast so it it's it's sometimes referred to as like a plant-based um Serum. So I don't want to kind of get too technical, but essentially it, has, it can have the positive effects of estrogen in some tissues, and then and then um, and it blocks the negative effects in others. So it blocks um, any damaging effects in the breast and 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 also in and the, in the womb as well. So it, it, there's actually studies showing that there has, there's a reduced risk of recurrence of breast cancer in patients who've had breast cancer in the past and those who consume soya. Um, and women who um, eat a lot of soya or have grown up eating, say, two or three servings of whole foods kind of soya, so in, in the Far East, have a lower risk of heart, um, of, sorry, of osteoporosis, so thinning of the bones, but also um, of breast cancer. Um, so all the evidence really is, is pretty positive, um, and I haven't seen anything that really is concerned. I mean, a lot of things are taken out of context in research, and then they're put in, you know, put on media, and then there's all these scare stories. And I think that's where the issue is, really. Yeah, that's where the biggest problem lies. Always, I think, with anything when it comes to, especially when it comes to food, and you know what what you should be eating and what you should be avoiding. And mm. every day you wake up at something else that's going to kill you. <laughs> well, essentially, I mean, essentially, soya is just a bean. I mean, I. I, I I don't know why there, there is so much scaremongering about it because it's it's a, it's a bean and it's a healthy staple in many um, you know especially in like places like Japan and, and China it, their daily diet and that includes in you know men's diets as well so there's some scare stories or you know men are going to develop breasts or are going to become yeah, a if they eat soya. <laughs> Um, and there's no good evidence to that. Again, if you kind of go back to the original research, a lot of it's done on high dose soya supplements given to mice, at, at, you know, far higher kind of doses and potency than you'd ever consume if you were just eating a normal diet. So, yeah. I mean, again, with any foods, I think it's better to focus on the whole, you know, food forms to have like tofu and tempeh, miso, um, or things like soya milk rather than the soya protein isolate you might get in. You, you know, like protein bars and stuff. I stick with the whole foods, really, because that you're not going to get the benefits from the soy protein um, isolate, really. Oh, that's some great advice, definitely. Totally agree there. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll go through a couple of questions that I've got from some of our members. Mm -hmm. um, now, just as a sort of caveat before we start, obviously you're not giving medical advice to individual people, um, mm -hmm. but um, some of these questions are ones that I get asked like, loads Um I won't name any names as to who's mm -hmm. asked them, but we'll just uh, go for it. So this is a really common one. Um, why does menopause cause such drastic weight gain and why is it so difficult to lose again? It's it's a, it's a tricky one, really. We know that um, that menopause does cause weight gain and it co tends um, to cause women to gain weight around their middle, so around their abdomen. Um, and uh, I know this is a cause of frustration for a lot of women, and it does seem to be quite difficult to shift it. Essentially, it's because um, our body is trying to keep, uh, you know, produce its own store of estrogen. Um, and so it does that by creating this fat store, which then um, acts like an endocrine organ and produces postmenopausal estrogen, so estrone. So the estrogen that we produce for premenopause and that is in the HRT is called estradiol, but the, the the estrogen that's in the fat is, is estrone. Um, and so that, that's why pe women often develop a bit more of a tummy um, and, that's, and, 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 and can hold on to it there. I think that you can um, you may, you know, lose it or at least reduce it, I think, through you know, diet and lifestyle efforts. But strength training is really important because I think the other thing is women lose muscle mass. And that's really important because um, that has a negative impact on our overall you know, health going forwards. So focusing on things like strength training um, um, and, and eating kind of like largely, a, you know, a whole food kind of diet is, is really important there. HRT can help balance it a little bit so there was a japanese study which which showed that uh, you know um, women who were on hrt seemed to regain a little bit more of that waist definition um 
but again it's it, it's it's difficult to say we would never give hrt to kind of for weight loss per se but it can just help balance things a little bit and whether it's or not it's that women feel a bit better if they're on hrt therefore can exercise and make better healthy food choices i don't know but i think some of it's kind of balancing the system again yeah as a, and i suppose as well if you're dealing with these kinds of symptoms it's and you're feeling so under the weather or unwell a lot of the time or maybe you're lacking sleep um perhaps you're just your everyday movement is going you know is going down oh exactly anyway yeah. um and it's much harder to make good food choices when you're exhausted and and mm-hmm. not feeling well so that you know that could have would you say that could contribute to oh no def- definitely i think it's one of the biggest things i think it's all again although i always talk about diet and lifestyle with patients um it's really hard to you know to make those changes if you're getting three or four hours of sleep at night and you're having to deal with work and children and everything else and you're just ap- you just need to get through the day so i think if we're if women can feel better in themselves in a way so maybe that is hrt or maybe you know it, it may be an, an alternative they they can you know i think that that can help enormously and then if you are feeling better it's easy like you say it's easier to make those changes and yes yeah, sleep's a huge thing in menopause that is hugely problematic for women so yeah, very compromised when you're feeling like that i would imagine mm-hmm. um i have another question again these are um asking for dietary changes or supplements um i'm 41 i have pcos polycystic ovarian mm-hmm. syndrome and fibroids i get god awful mood swings not only in the run-up to my period but when it's finished my mood crashes badly for a couple of days. Are there any dietary changes or supplements that could help me tackle this? She says she has tried the mini pill, but it made her permanently angry um, mm-hmm. and doesn't want a marina. Um, I don't know what sure uh, what other options might be available. So, um, I mean, polycystic ovarian syndrome is more of a kind of a metabolic dis- disorder. So, the, you know, there can be issues to do with like insulin resistance and blood blood sugar control issues. And so um, diet is really important when it comes to polycystic ovarian syndrome. And, and that, that can help with some of the mood swings that are associated. Um, so I guess making sure you're kind of, uh, you know, minimizing junk and processed foods and, and having largely anti-inflammatory diet. So again, largely I'd recommend really a plant-based diet focusing on kind of complex carbs and plant-based fats, so seeds and nuts and things like that and, and plenty of, of beans and greens and leafy veg, minimizing things like, um, you know, white sugar and, 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 and alcohol and caffeine because that can disrupt the, the whole of the endocrine hormonal, you know, hormonal system system um that would that's one thing i would do you know take a look at that try and focus your diet around that in terms of 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 hormones um it might be worth i I think keep keeping a track of symptoms to see if there's kind of an element of like pms going on it can be quite hard with polycystic ovaries ovarian syndrome because your periods tend to be irregular and to see if if it's the two weeks leading up to that when mood is particularly bad i know she said it crashed again after her period so i think it'd be really important to track symptoms to see exactly when um when those mood changes are occurring um because if there's an element of kind of PMS and stuff going on in there as well, we can use hormone therapy again to kind of help with those fluctuations and help balance things out. So it might be, um, you know, I don't know, seeing somebody who is kind of like a specialist in that area if the lifestyle measures don't really help. Um, again, like exercise, strength training and things will, will help with hormonal balance and, and reducing weight and minimising symptoms and stuff as well. Yeah, I think... Um I think these the, these questions are you know they're asking about different symptoms but the mm. the answer is often the same or similar isn't it um, definitely most, yeah um, let's carry on with the last two um, is there anything I can take for night sweats that won't affect my medication for arthritis I don't know if this is maybe a question that um, this lady should possibly go and see her own GP about <laughs> um, but you know again from from a sort of nutritional standpoint possibly um it, it depends which um was it was it specifically about nutrition um was- no no she just said is there anything i can take that won't affect my medication for arthritis um methotrexate 
yeah. hydro I, I can't read that word <laughs> I'm not even going to try I'm going to I think, I think this is, I think this is the, a question you sent me over email before today. so I think I've seen the drugs and there's nothing there that says that she couldn't have HRT um, and so it would be worth seeing somebody about that if she's really struggling because they will be the most effective but if she would prefer to try something else um, I, I guess could try something like this. The, the there are some soya based supplements out there that, that that can be helpful. They're not generally as effective um, as as HRT. Um, the other thing, again, in terms of uh, diet and lifestyle, is again going back to a plant based diet because it's an anti inflammatory diet. There's a a paper um, that I I came across recently to looking at, looking at all dietary approaches to managing rheumatoid arthritis, and again it advocated a plant based diet and just saying it seems to be one of the, the better ways to manage these symptoms. So again, I, I would I would I would look at that really. Mm-hmm. And just for a li- for our listeners that um, are not one hundred percent sure what we are talking about when we talk about a plant based diet, we're speaking about a diet that is free from animal products, but um, focusing on eating whole foods is that that be the best way of putting it <laughs> oh are you still there i am yes oh. <laughs> it just i don't know it must have cut off did you hear what did you hear what i said there yeah i am yes they were talking about what a, plant, a whole food, a whole yeah, food plant-based diet that, that are not entirely sure what exactly we mean by that yeah so uh, you're focusing your diet um you know, on um, fr- you know fruits and vegetables, beans, whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, and minimising processed foods really, and and um, e- you know excess you know sugar and oils and stuff. I mean, I'm not. I, I know some people will say you know cut out all oils and sugars and things like that. I I think a diet has to be sustainable and and. Um, you know, a little bit isn't isn't probably going to hurt, harm you if, if you can kind of make most you know baby base most of your meals like eighty percent of them around those kind of foods that we talked about. So yes, ideally, I recommend a diet free from animal products. But if that's not something that's the way you eat at the moment, it's good to kind of do your research and make sure you're doing it properly and not just cutting out things without adding the right kind of you know healthy nutrients in. So even if people aren't completely vegetarian or vegan, I think everyone can benefit from just adding more plants into their diet really. So I think it's just about making sure your your plate is full of you know coloured fruits and veg and and you know and eating a wide variety. We know that that's more and more important now, especially for gut health and we now know that gut health has an impact on hormonal health and mental health. So, um, yeah, but I think, again, focusing on foods that is just recognisable as foods in their own right and not things that come in packages. But it's easier said than done because we're all busy and um, <laughs> we, it's great to cook from scratch. And I try to do it as much as possible, but there will be some times when it's just not possible. So I think as long as most of the time you're able to do that, I think that's the main thing. Yeah, definitely. Um the last question is uh, regarding weight gain again or losing weight. Um, I'm menopausal and hypothyroid for over 20 years and despite blood results always being normal, uh, losing weight seems nearly impossible. So what she, what she's asking is after a certain age, do you need to get really strict with your calorie intake in order to lose weight? Um, well, I think we, you know, metabolism does slow down as we as we get older um and so we probably do need fewer calories as we get older but i'm not really a fan of advocating calorie restriction um and again this is where it comes back to my recommendation of focusing most of your um foods around you know whole plant foods um because they tend to be lower in in calories but higher in nutrients and you tend to they can feel you can eat eat more because they're bulkier in volume so you can feel more satisfied so that's what I would tend to focus on um and I you know I I do see women who've made changes to their diet so they've not necessarily gone vegetarian or vegan but they've made you know making big changes in that direction and they they are losing weight and and things that you know that that can have quite profound impacts but they're not eating less in fact I sometimes think people need to eat more but just more of the right foods um so that, that it goes back to the same, same yeah, thing yeah uh, you know just like uh, from a personal level like sometimes I feel like I'm eating I eat a lot of food and um, mm-hmm. but like you say like plant-based foods because are, are so low energy dense that you can eat a lot more there's a lot more fiber you feel a lot fuller um and sometimes my friend my friends will say to me I don't know how you can eat that much like food I'm like well 
it doesn't you know it's it's you just get to eat more when you eat more plants it's just it fills you up um yeah no it, exactly i think there's a, there's a good diagrams i've seen i think online of stomach where you, you pour some oil into the stomach with there's meat in one stomach and then fruit and veg in the other and it's the same yeah. amount of calories in each but it's only the stomach that you know that's absolutely full of the fruit and veg and you realize that what difference it makes to what you know the actual kinds of foods you're eating and how satisfied you'll be and i think it's always hard if if you don't eat a certain way and someone's telling you, you know, you need to change your diet or you're advised to kind of change it in a certain way, it can feel a bit daunting. But I think if you can do things slowly, I mean, I say to patients, you know, because I'm really keen on people increasing things like lentils and beans in their diet. So if they like making a spaghetti bolognese, but they don't want to kind of jump straight in and make a, a, a veggie one, for example, we'll say, well, in, with, with the meat, maybe add, you know, have half the meat and then you add, add um, lentils to the other half and bulk it out with mushrooms or something. Mm-hmm because that's then reducing the saturated fat and everything else and then you can kind of maybe at one point it will become 100% um, vegetarian bolognese but even if you're just cutting it a little bit and adding in those beans and lentils it's just it's going to have health benefits yeah it's so just about changing when you're changing habits I guess it's just about learning how to change them slowly and um, and not try to give yourself a, an overnight overhaul <laughs> No, then that just it just becomes too daunting, and if you're already feeling down and and stuff finding stuff hard, it's it yeah it's kind of demotivating, isn't it? So I think just making you know one change a week or something over several weeks can have a massive impact. And so I often recommend women um, switch from cow's milk to say soya um, oat or hemp milk, as long you know making sure that they're fortified with the calcium because they're more heart healthy and things like hemp milk have got lots of omega threes in them and the soy milks get heart healthy oat milk's got fiber in it again that's good for the heart so um you know and i and that can just have a change even if you just change your milk over you know things like that make a big difference yeah i think that's great advice thank you so much um if uh, those that are listening want to find out more about more about you and what you do is there a uh, is there somewhere they can go to to find out more uh well i've got a website um which is just drhannashort.co.uk and i've also got a, a professional facebook page so i try and share you know interesting articles and information and stuff on that and that's just dr hannah short i think um and i'm all, i'm also on twitter so that's a bit of a combination between my uh, it's kind of personal and professional so but but um yeah so probably with the facebook one's probably the best one um but and then there's links to my facebook um to my website and stuff on there as well that's great i'll um i'll make sure that all of the links are in the show notes to go with the podcast so if you're listening and you want to find out more all you need to do is just scroll down on itunes or spotify or wherever you're listening and all the links that we've talked about um, will be just there for you to click and um just i guess what's left to say is thank you very much for your time i really no. appreciate it a lot <laughs> well thank you for having me and um i also just wanted to say quickly because i know i mentioned about hrt obviously some women aren't able to take it and i want them to know there there are other options and <laughs> so um it's worth um speaking to their gp or being referred to a menopause specialist if women are struggling so i don't want people to go over the message it's the it's the only thing cause there are women for example on breast cancer treatment who won't be um able to take hrt but um yeah i i just want to know they're not they're not on their own and there there is help available that's great thank you so much okay thank you i'd just like to say again thank you very much hannah for your time today i'm sure the listeners have got a lot from this episode um like i said before if you have enjoyed this episode please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast whether you're listening on itunes or spotify or even on youtube and don't forget if you have enjoyed please share it with someone who may get the benefit of it as well if you'd like to get in touch with either of us um, i'll leave all of our links below so wherever you're listening just scroll down and all the links will be there you can just click on those i will be back again next thursday with another episode of the ditch the diet podcast until then thank you very much for listening and i'll see you soon